Arachibuterophobia. Let's start with a phobia that sounds like a joke but feels like a nightmare. Arachibuterophobia. From the Greek arachis, meaning peanut, and biteron, meaning butter. This isn't the fear of peanut butter itself. Oh no, that would be too simple. This is the intensely specific claustrophobic terror of having peanut butter stick to the roof of your mouth. While others enjoy a PB&J, the arachibuterophobe is envisioning a scenario of oral suffocation, a sticky, inescapable doom. Their heart rate skyrockets, sweat beads on their forehead, and the texture of the peanut butter transforms from a delicious spread into a relentless, smothering adhesive. The psychological root here isn't about the food, but the loss of control. It's a form of pseudodysphagia, the fear of choking. The sensation of the thick paste adhering to the palate triggers a primal panic response. The brain, in its infinite and often unhelpful wisdom, misinterprets this sticky sensation as a genuine threat to the airway. It screams, We're glued shut! This is the end! Even as the logical part of the mind knows it can be washed down with milk. This fear can stem from a past choking incident, perhaps as a child, where a legitimate scare gets permanently wired to a specific texture. Or it can be learned, watching someone else have a coughing fit after a large spoonful of the stuff. The mind creates a powerful, albeit irrational, association. Sticky roof of mouth equals imminent death. For the arachibotyrophobe, every jar of peanut butter is a potential pot of panic, a creamy beige vessel of existential dread that makes them eye a simple sandwich with the suspicion usually reserved for a ticking bomb. It's a perfect example of the brain's talent for taking a minor physical annoyance and catastrophizing it into a full-blown survival crisis. Nomophobia. Welcome to the most modern of terrors, nomophobia, a clunky portmanteau of no mobile phone phobia. This is the panic that washes over you when you've lost your phone, the battery dies, or you're trapped somewhere with no signal. It's not just inconvenience, it's a genuine psychological distress that mirrors withdrawal. The symptoms are textbook anxiety, shortness of breath, trembling, disorientation, and an overwhelming feeling of isolation. In a world where our phones are external hard drives for our brains and our primary portal to social connection, being without one feels like a sensory deprivation. You're not just disconnected from the internet, you feel disconnected from society, from your own identity. This fear is a cocktail of other, older anxieties, repackaged for the digital age. It's agoraphobia, fear of being unable to escape or call for help, claustrophobia, feeling trapped and cut off, and separation anxiety all rolled into one. Our phones are our lifelines, our maps, our encyclopedias, and our social validation machines. Losing that connection triggers a profound sense of vulnerability. Neurochemically, the constant pings and notifications from our devices create a dopamine feedback loop, similar to a slot machine. When that loop is broken, the brain enters a state of withdrawal, craving the next hit of digital stimulus. Nomophobia is the existential dread of the 21st century, a testament to how deeply we've outsourced our cognitive and emotional security to a small glass rectangle. It's the fear of being alone with your own thoughts, without the comforting glow of a screen to distract you from the silence. It's not the fear of losing a device, it's the fear of losing your connection to everything. Xanthophobia. Color is supposed to be a neutral property of light, but not for the xanthophobe. From the Greek xanthos, meaning yellow, this is an irrational and often debilitating fear of the color yellow. This isn't a mild dislike or a preference for cooler tones. We're talking about a full-blown panic attack at the sight of a lemon, a school bus, or a field of sunflowers. The world becomes a minefield of potential triggers. Post-it notes are instruments of torture. The golden arches are gateways, are gateways to hell. A smiley face emoji is a harbinger of doom. The origins of such a specific fear are often symbolic and deeply personal. In some cultures, yellow is associated with sickness, jaundice, and decay, creating a powerful negative connotation. A traumatic event involving something yellow, a bee sting, a particular car in an accident, a room in a hospital, can cement the color as a symbol of danger. The brain, in its effort to protect you, creates a shortcut, yellow eep owl's threat. This conditioning can be so powerful that the phobic response becomes automatic and overwhelming. The individual might logically know that a banana is harmless, but their amygdala, the brain's alarm system, is already screaming bloody murder. 
Living with xanthophobia requires a constant, exhausting vigilance. It means vetting restaurants for their decor, avoiding certain aisles in the grocery store, and explaining to confused friends why you can't look at, look at their new raincoat. It's a stark reminder that our perception of reality is not objective. It's painted, sometimes in terrifyingly specific shades, by the brush of our past experiences and deepest anxieties. Globophobia. Balloons. To most, they are symbols of celebration, childhood, and joy. To a globophobe, they are latex time bombs filled with compressed terror. Globophobia, from the Greek globos for sphere, is the fear of balloons. More specifically for many, it's the fear of balloons popping. The anticipation is the true torture. Being in a room full of balloons is like being in a hostage situation where any sudden movement or change in temperature could trigger a deafening explosion. The globophobe is in a state of hyper-arousal, their senses on high alert, listening for the squeak of rubbing latex that signals an impending pop. This phobia is a classic example of phonophobia, the fear of loud noises, but with a unique visual trigger. The pop of a balloon is sudden, sharp, and impossible to predict, hijacking the body's startle response. For someone with a sensitive nervous system or a history of trauma related to loud, sudden sounds, like veterans with PTSD, a balloon is not an innocent party favor, it's a weapon. The fear can also be linked to a childhood incident, a balloon popping unexpectedly in their face, causing shock and pain. The brain logs this event and says, never again. From that point on, the sight of a balloon triggers the same fight-or-flight response as the, the original traumatic event. The tension of the inflated latex becomes a perfect metaphor for the phobic's own internal state, stretched to its limit, ready to burst at any moment. It transforms birthday parties, parades, and even some marketing events into landscapes of pure anxiety, forcing them to navigate a world where joy for others is a source of profound and explosive fear for them. Omphalophobia, the belly button, the omphalos, a strange swirly scar that reminds us we were once tethered to another human being. For most, it's an afterthought, a place to collect lint. For the omphalophobe, it is a source of profound disgust and terror. This is the fear of navels, their own, or others. The thought of seeing one, and especially touching one, can induce nausea, panic, and a visceral sense of revulsion. They might tape over their own belly button, avoid swimming pools and beaches, and recoil if someone's shirt rides up. The psychology here is complex, touching on deep-seated anxieties about the body, connection, and cleanliness. The navel is, in essence, a strange-looking hole in the body, which can tap into a broader trypophobia, fear of holes. It's also a reminder of the umbilical cord and the womb, which can trigger subconscious anxieties related to birth, maternal connection, or separation. Some psychoanalytic theories might link it to castration anxiety, viewing the navel as a symbolic wound. More practically, it can be seen as a harbor for dirt and bacteria, triggering a form of mysophobia, fear of germs. The fear could also originate from a childhood misunderstanding or a scary story about the belly button unraveling or something coming out of it. The mind latches onto this bizarre idea and elevates it to the level of a legitimate threat. Omphalophobia highlights the brain's capacity to fixate on a seemingly benign part of the human form and imbue it with a level of horror that makes a fundamental aspect of one's own body feel alien and repulsive. Trypophobia. Trypophobia is a fear that has exploded in the internet age, a revulsion so primal it barely needs a Greek root. Tripa means hole. It is an intense, visceral aversion to patterns of holes or bumps. Think lotus seed pods, honeycombs, aerated chocolate, or even the pores on a strawberry. For a tripophobe, seeing these patterns doesn't just cause fear, it causes a full-body cringe. They report skin crawling, itching, nausea, and a feeling of deep, instinctual disgust. It's as if their brain is screaming, wrong, that's not supposed to look like that. Unlike many phobias, researchers believe trypophobia isn't rooted in a learned, traumatic experience, but in an evolutionary survival instinct. Many of the world's most dangerous animals, snakes, spiders, scorpions, have patterns on their skin that mimic trypophobic triggers. The clustered holes also resemble the patterns of infectious diseases, like smallpox or measles, or decaying infested flesh. Therefore, the theory goes, trypophobia is a vestigial, overactive defense mechanism. Our brains evolved to recognize these patterns as signs of danger, venom, poison, or disease, 
and to react with immediate revulsion to keep us away. In the modern world, this pattern recognition software misfires, flagging a harmless seed pod with the same level of alarm as a blue-ringed octopus. It's a fascinating glitch in our evolutionary code, a ghost of a survival instinct that now causes people to feel physically ill at the sight of their morning crumpet. It's not a fear of holes, but a fear of what holes have historically implied. Death, disease, and danger. Phobophobia. Now we enter the Hall of Mirrors. Phobophobia. From phobos, meaning fear. This is the fear of being afraid. It is one of a handful of metaphobias, a self-referential loop of anxiety that can be incredibly crippling. The phobophobe isn't afraid of a specific object or situation, but of the internal sensations of panic itself. The racing heart, the shortness of breath, the dizziness, the feeling of losing control. They live in a state of constant, anxious anticipation, terrified that a panic attack might strike at any moment. This often develops in people who already have an anxiety disorder or another phobia. After experiencing a few intense panic attacks, they start to fear the attack itself more than the original trigger. The focus of their anxiety shifts inward. The thought process becomes a vicious cycle. What if I get scared? Oh no, I'm thinking about being scared, which is making me scared. My heart is beating faster. This is it. It's happening. This feedback loop can generate a panic attack out of thin air. It's the ultimate trap of anxiety, where the mind becomes its own tormentor. Living with phobophobia is like walking on an emotional tightrope, constantly monitoring your internal state for the slightest sign of fear, which, paradoxically, is the very thing that creates it. It represents a total loss of trust in one's own body and mind. Treatment involves breaking this cycle, teaching the individual to accept the physical sensations of fear without catastrophizing them. To learn that fear is just a feeling, an uncomfortable but ultimately harmless signal that doesn't have to spiral into a full-blown crisis. Ablutophobia. Ablutophobia, from the Latin ablutere, to wash off, is the persistent, abnormal, and unwarranted fear of bathing, washing, or cleaning. In a society obsessed with hygiene, this phobia is particularly stigmatizing and misunderstood. It's not about being lazy or dirty by choice. It's a genuine terror associated with the act of getting into a shower, bath, or even just washing one's hands. The sufferer may experience intense anxiety, dread, and panic attacks when faced with the prospect of cleaning themselves. This can lead to significant social and health problems, including skin diseases, infections, and ostracism. The roots of ablutophobia are often tied to a specific water-related trauma. A near-drowning experience as a child, slipping and getting seriously injured in a bathtub, or even being subjected to abusive or traumatic bathing experiences can create a powerful and lasting fear. The mind links the act of washing with overwhelming danger and pain. It can also be connected to other phobias, like a fear of being naked and vulnerable, or even a fear of chemicals and soaps and shampoos. In some cases, it can be purely sensory. The feeling of water on the skin or the temperature changes can be perceived as intensely unpleasant or threatening. The movie Psycho certainly didn't help the public perception of shower safety. For the ablutophobe, the bathroom is not a sanctuary of cleanliness and relaxation. It's a chamber of horrors, a place where they must confront a deep-seated terror just to perform one of the most basic acts of self-care, pogonophobia. Pogonophobia, from the Greek pogon for beard, is the fear of beards. In an era where the hipster beard has become a cultural staple, this phobia can make navigating a coffee shop a truly harrowing experience. The pogonophobe may feel intense anxiety, nausea, or dread when seeing a man with a beard, especially a long or unkempt one. They might cross the street to avoid a bearded individual or feel unable to interact with bearded colleagues or family members. The fear can have several origins. Historically and culturally, beards have carried a wide range of symbolic meanings. They can be associated with roughness, wildness, and a lack of refinement, or conversely, with wisdom and authority. For a pogonophobe, the association is invariably negative. They might perceive bearded men as unhygienic, untrustworthy, or threatening. This could be rooted in a frightening childhood encounter with a bearded person. It can also be linked to a fear of the unknown. The beard obscures part of the face, hiding facial expressions and making it harder to read a person's intentions. In a world where we rely on facial cues for social navigation, this can be deeply unsettling. Furthermore, beards can be associated with certain religious or political groups that the individual may fear or distrust. In essence, the beard becomes a physical symbol, 
onto which a whole host of other anxieties about masculinity, cleanliness, deception, or danger are projected. It's not just about the hair, it's about what the hair might be hiding, agoraphobia. Finally, we have agyrophobia, the fear of crossing streets, roads, or highways. This is not to be confused with the fear of cars. The agyrophobe can be perfectly comfortable driving or riding in a vehicle. Their terror is specifically triggered by the act of being a pedestrian, trying to navigate a path of traffic. The name comes from the Greek gyrus, meaning turning or whirling, as in the whirling of traffic. This phobia can be so severe that it renders a person unable to leave their own city block, effectively trapping them in a small geographical prison. Agerophobia is a complex fear that often bundles several anxieties together. There is the obvious fear of being hit by a car, a rational concern blown up to phobic proportions. But it's also a fear of open spaces, agoraphobia, a fear of making a decision under pressure, when to cross, and a fear of losing control in a fast-moving, chaotic environment. The phobic individual might experience overwhelming sensory input, the noise of the engines, the speed of the cars, the changing lights, which triggers a panic attack. They may have a what-if spiral. What if I trip? What if I freeze in the middle of the road? What if a car doesn't see me? This fear can be initiated by witnessing or being in a traffic accident, or simply by the constant media reports of pedestrian fatalities. It's a phobia that turns the simple act of getting to the other side of the street into an epic battle against perceived mortal danger, transforming a mundane urban landscape into a terrifying, uncrossable chasm.